Good morning and welcome to worship at Groffdale. Uh, if you would take your hymn book, number 592, the blue hymnal, 592, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling. And if you're able, let's stand together. Good morning. Welcome to all that are worshiping with us this today, whether it's in person, live stream, or by listening in on the telephone. And I trust that you will experience the presence of God wherever or wherever you are and whatever manner you are joining us today. Today is Father's Day. For some of you, it might be an easy and glad celebration and remembrance. For others, it may be a day that's mixed with sorrow and regret for a relationship that once was and now is gone or for a desired relationship that was never experienced. That can make the celebration of Father's Day easy for some and difficult for others. So whether Father's Day is easy or difficult, we can find the object of our worship to be greater than our earthly relationship. God is that greater relationship available to us. 1 John 3, 1, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. 
The reason the world doesn't know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. We're not only allowed, but encouraged to call him Father. God demonstrated that he has a son-like love for us. Not only are we called to uh, his children, but we are his children. No longer is there a love that needs to be earned or an angry father to be appeased. As believers in Christ, we can be eternally secure in his love for us, content that his wrath has forever been appeased by Christ's work on the cross. And long before 1 John was written, the writer of Lamentations in chapter 3 gave testimony to God's love for us. Uh, verses 21 to 23, or 24. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. And these verses were written after the first 20 verses of Lamentations sort of laid out all the challenges the writer was going through. Yet this I call to mind, that, and therefore I have hope, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They're new every morning, great as your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore, therefore I will wait on him. The Hebrew word for love is, used for love is hesed, and has a sense of loyal love, committed love, and settled love. It's not, a, not about any kind of superficial attraction, nor is it um, a response to someone's goodness. I said love is God's choice. It is God's decision. It is settled, fixed, and final. It's a love that will never change, a love given freely and forever by God who has chosen us as those he will love. God loves us because it's his will to love us. God's love will not change, will not forget, will not be put off by our failings, and will be the same morning by morning, day by day, year by year. Great is his faithfulness. So on this Father's Day, whether it's easy or difficult, let this be our deep satisfaction and joy. God in heaven, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the eternal father, the prince of peace, he is our father. You are completely secure in his unchanging love. He delights in our fellowship and is giving abundantly all that we need. God is our father. Would those uh, receiving the tithes and offerings come forward please? <clears throat> Love prayer. Offering today's for leadership support. Let's pray. Abba God, we just are so thankful that we have a Father that will forever be faithful, forever love us, forever be with us, and that we can look to you in confidence, and that we, in confidence, can um, enter into your presence through Jesus, the one who's paid for our failings, the one who, whose blood covers us, that we are um, able to come perfect into your presence. Thank you, God, that we have this privilege. And so it's a privilege to us this morning to give back a portion of what you have given us. We confess, Lord, that you've given us everything we have. So as a token of our appreci uh, appreciation, God, we give this in support of our leadership team 
And we pray that you would bless them and encourage them and give them wisdom. And we thank you for them. We pray especially as they uh, are traveling this uh, week that you would be with them, encourage them, and Lord, we just uh, give them, to lift them up to you. We thank you through Jesus. Amen. After the offering, Mag will have a time with the children. Come on up, kids. <laughs> Great. I was hoping that you'd all come up with me, and then they'd clap for me, too, but they didn't do that. <laughs> So, good morning, and I'm going to start out with a really easy question. What's special about today? Father's Day. Yeah, right. Didn't take too much thinking for that. It's a special day for our fathers, for our grandfathers, our uncles, our big brothers. So, and as you know, we're going to have honor our fathers this morning with a picture show. So, we will get started. Oh, Adriel, you're first. So what do you like doing with your... I like building a birdhouse with him. Okay. And I'm curious, is he blow-drying your hair in this picture? <laughs> Getting you ready for school? Or church? Oh, it was up in New York. Okay. All right, that's a special picture. All right, next. Um, Lucinda is not here. She's on a trip. But she likes being outdoors with her dad. And of course, they're swinging in this picture. Okay, next. I like, going, I like going fishing with my grandpa. Okay, that looks fun. That was Jose. All right, next. Um, okay, Heavenly is not here this morning. And I didn't get a comment, but it looks like she's having a happy time with her dad. Okay, next. And Brandon is not here, but he likes to go dirt biking with his grandpa Snader. All right. <laughs> Ezekiel, look, who's that? Who, is, who are you with? Is that daddy? Is that daddy? How did you get up there? <laughs> okay, I just thought that was a cute picture and had to put that up there. Okay. Next, Lucas. I like helping my pop mow the yard. Okay. okay, I bet he appreciates that help. Okay, next. I like to play Legos and swing my, with my dad. All right, that was Elise. And next, Joshua. I like going camping with my dad. Okay. 
always fun to go camping. And that picture, you're on your way to Cuba, aren't you? In an airplane. Mm -hmm. Next. I like to play Roma Cube with my dad. All right. Lots of fun games. Anybody else left? Does that? Oh, of course. <laughs> I like to go camping and build stuff with my dad. Okay. All right. And I think that's it. Are we done? Yep. Okay. All right. Well, that was really special, I think. Um, you all have special things that you do with your dads or your grandpas. And um, before we go, I am going to read some verses. Three verses. One is for you kids, one is for your dads, and one is for our, about our Heavenly Father. Now this first one for you kids. I changed one of the words because I didn't like it, but I think I'm okay because it didn't change the meaning. It's from Proverbs. Listen to your fathers who gave you life and do not, whoops, okay, this is where I changed it, and respect your mother when she is old. Now, I think King Solomon should have said, and respect your mothers when they're young too, right? <laughs> okay. All right, and then this one is for the dads. Um, start your children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. That's also from Proverbs. And the last one about our Heavenly Father. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. All right, those are words from, that was from the Psalms from King David. One more thing, we're going to give our fathers and uncles and grandpas and men in our church a special little treat this morning, and you're going to help me. Okay? So, I think to make it easier, if you are a man, 18 years or older, would you please stand up? If you can't stand up, raise your hand. And these kids are going to hand out a little treat for you. So take a whole bunch. And as you receive your treat, then you can sit down. That way nobody's going to get missed. And there's a man up there in the booth. Don't forget him. Somebody let Ezekiel give you a treat, okay? He wants to help. Thank you all for passing out those gifts to us. A scripture reading in preparation for our message this morning from Brother Lloyd is uh, Luke 14, Luke chapter 14, verses 15 to 23. And in your pew Bible, it is page 1034, 1034. Luke 14, 15 to 23. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one 
who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come for, come for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. So the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. Louis, if you'd come. God, we thank you that you've invited us to your feast. Mm -hmm. yes. And Lord, we just uh, wait on you to hear your word now this morning through your servant, Lloyd. We pray that you'd speak to him what you want us to hear. Open the eyes of our heart so that we could understand. We pray through Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Levi, and good morning to each of you. Uh, Elaine and I are glad to be able to be with you here today. The, the psalmist said, I was glad when he said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And it's great to be able to fellowship together here. And to all of those on, online, I hope that somehow you're able to be able to feel part of what is happening here as we gather at uh, this setting here called Grafdale here today. So uh, may the Lord meet us wherever we may be at in the world as we're connecting in this setting. I recognize uh, the absence of a few here today, like uh, Pastor Tom and Jen, Jennifer. Uh, I trust that they're having a great time. I know they're having a great time. I've heard from Andreas and Angelica, and they're very blessed to have them there in their setting. In fact, I'm a little bit jealous this morning. I think it would be fun to be able to be there in Morocco with them. I also recognize that there are some of us that are in Costa Rica today as the youth groups are, uh, Carpenter and Graftier youth groups are sharing this time on this mission experience in Costa Rica. A little jealous, I think I could enjoy that as well there in Costa Rica. Oh, my nephew, uh, Daryl, <laughs> Hoover and his wife Jennifer are leaders there and what's happening there and I'm sure they're having a, uh, an amazing time as I think there are like 120 that are there a part of the mission outreach young people gathering together and then we have those that are in Europe with the Mennonite Children's Choir. And I'd be a, a bit jealous in light of all my good times in Europe over the years that I'm sure they're having a great time as well. So uh, we're a gathered congregation here today, but we're also somewhat scattered here today. And uh, that is good as God is, is, is with them wherever they are. Well, happy Father's Day. May you as fathers be blessed I, we just celebrated Mother's Day as well, uh, so I suppose it's a little bit, it's okay to heap a bit of appreciation here on fathers in light of who you are and your significant roles. And I know that um, all of us have been in some way touched by a father or fathers in our lives. And in light of even the loss of significant fathers in this congregation over these last months or last years here uh, in the midst of that grieving uh, may you find great peace and consolation 
in your heavenly Father who will never leave you nor forsake you and is there with you in a very special way if you have lost a father or a father figure in your life. This morning, I would like to share from this theme that I consider the greatest invitation in Scripture. And this invitation is simply this, come to the table. This is an extension of a great weekend that we had last weekend in LMC, and this was on the hill at Camp Hebron, a first time ever experience in LMC to have an overnighter as a celebration of church life experience. And it was a wonderful time. Elaine and I were privileged to be able to be part of it and uh, the, the 360 capacity crowd that was there at Camp Hebron found themselves in all kinds of different settings in order to have lodging. They filled their cabins and and, uh, and the lodges were all exploding with people. And it was just a wonderful sense of being together as the people of God. It was a, a setting like I don't recall ever experiencing an LMC as um, it, was, it was a great time of wonderful fellowship and food around the table. It was a wonderful time of great teaching and preaching and sharing in seminars and a good time of just encouraging each other and being God's children. What was unique about it that, that was, I felt, somewhat new uh, in this kind of a gathering was that I, I really believe that it's possible that to be white in that setting was the minority. And that, that was such a blessed time because it was really a reality of a, the picture of the Mennonite church because to be white in the context of the Mennonite people, Mennonite uh, world, is to be ma a minority. <laughs> and that's not our typical picture, but it, it was just a really blessed time of fellowshipping, getting to meet individuals that we typically don't have that opportunity to relate to. I'm sure this will be... Uh, an opportunity again in the future to uh, be part of an overnight setting like this. I'm not sure uh, where we will find a venue in the future for, to be able to invite everyone across LMC to be able to come and enjoy this kind of an experience. Uh, but I'm, I know we'll be looking for one because Camp Hebron just didn't have the space to be able to offer uh, uh, the room for all those that wanted to come. So. We started turning people away two weeks before the actual event, uh, but it was, it was a really, really blessed time. Well, I would like for us to look at this picture that Jesus was, was sharing as he went from village to village on his way to Jerusalem, as we see here uh, in this text from Luke chapter 13, this one verse where it says there will, uh, people will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast or at the table in the kingdom of God. Some translations say table instead of feast, and I just really like that setting. That's the, the text that we used from the translation uh, using table at LMC's the Celebration of Church Life last weekend. This is a beautiful picture. And it's this picture of this wide invitation, this wide space for all to be able to come from all nations, from the north and the south and the east and the west. The table has been set. And this, this table that, that uh, Jesus was helping them to be able to envision, he says is, open to all it's a wide place but there is only one way to find your entry point into this space where this table is set and this 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 narrow door that Jesus describes is actually a a person 
and he was describing himself really as that narrow door because there's only one way into that space and that is through the person of Jesus Christ. There's just no other way to be able to find your place at, the, at your seat at that table other than through him. I want to say that, that this is the most inviting of opportunities in the whole of scriptures and the entirety of time to have this privilege to sit at this table. There is something about this table that is unlike any other table. It is like any other setting that you could find in the world. This is, this is far beyond just a sitting at a normal table. This is actually a, a right to have your place in the whole house in the house of God, in this place where Jesus reigns and Jesus uh, presides. It is a right to have a, a seat, a seat that has your name on it. It is a right to be the part of the family of God and to connect with he that is the father in this household, this one that is like no other. This one who is the great I am. He is the great Abba Father. He is uh, the, the, the great head of, of the body. He is the one that says, I love you with an everlasting love. The one that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He is the one that has set the table. He is the one that is providing the invitation for all that will come. You have heard people say probably already that you can call me anything but never call me late for dinner. And this is one of these settings for dinner that you will not want to be late for. As the scriptures would say, at some point the door will be closed, the invitation will be over, and you will no longer have this right and privilege to be able to come and take your seat, even, that there, even though that there's a seat there that has your name on it, regardless of what your name is and in what nationality you understand your name, there's a seat there that has your name on it, and there is that place for you. But there is a time when it will be too late to be able to take that place. I think it's a setting very similar to the God's plan that was revealed to the, his people, the people of Israel at the time of of, of the flood in the days of Noah. There was a time when the invitation was out there for all to come in and to come in through the door. But there became a time when it was too late and the door was shut. And only those that got on board and responded to the invitation were the ones that became the blessed ones, were the ones that were able to experience the life-giving blessing of God that was for those that respond to the call, the invitation to come and take your place at the table. The table is an amazing table. It's a call for all. But there are some that will miss it. It's a huge table. There are no seating limits. There are no fire codes that limit a certain amount of people in a certain amount of space because of the, the hazards. In fact, the interesting thing about this table is that it, the one who is seated at the head of the table says, I will baptize you. He was the one that would be known that would even baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. But the fire that will burn in the midst of this setting is not a fire that would be threatening to the life, and it, it happens to be a fire that will release the way for more life experience. The table is for personal seating. There is a your seat. Yesterday, Elaine and I had the, the privilege to be at a wedding for a grand niece of mine. And it was a wonderful time of gathering as it was a, it was a godly setting as they're both believers and it was just a really blessed time to in, enjoy this, this institution, this uh, called marriage, and to see a young couple 
uh, anticipate and be excited and commit themselves to this. But after the, after the actual ceremony, they had a beautiful tent set up in the outdoors, and in the center of this tent, there was a, a, a little centerpiece that uh, had lists of names and tables the whole way around this centerpiece in the midst of this whole tent full of tables, and you had to walk around this centerpiece and find the right list to find your name to see which table you were going to be seated at. And, and uh, Elaine left me uh, to uh, f- take that s- to take that step, and I started on the one side of this centerpiece and started checking the list. No name. Went around to the next side of it and checked the list there. No name. And I went the whole way around the table, and the last list. Our name was there. (laughs) Yeah, I guess we're at the right place at the right time. There's a seat here for us. It was a good feeling to be able to see your name on that list. (laughs) And I had to think about this privilege that we have to know that our name is on our seat. We have a seat at the table. Thank you, Lord. As we sit at the table, this table that has been set for us, It just so happens that your seat is at the head table. That wasn't the case yesterday with us. We were much further back the line. And I don't know how this table presents in this way, but I believe, as I understand the scriptures, uh, that it is for us to know that we are all seated right next to Jesus. (laughs) We have a seat at the head table. That's the way he would want for us to understand it. That's the way he would want for us to feel valued. That's the way that he sees his family and wants for them to understand his love and the extent of his love. That each one of us are seated at the head table with Jesus. Jesus tried to communicate this as good as he knew how and as he spent the last day with his disciples before his crucifixion, and he gathered them together in an upper room. And guess what he did? He set a table. And they all had a seat there at the table. They were all invited to take their place there. And then, in that setting, as the scriptures would say, he showed them the full extent of his love. That's the kind of experience that he had wants for his children to understand at the table that they may experience the full extent of his love and 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 he does what would be unexpected of one at the head of the table and he actually humbles himself and washes their feet because he realizes that one of the ways to show love is to serve others and he wanted his disciples to understand that to understand the dynamics of his kingdom and the un- dynamics of this table that is set, that, that, that a commitment to serve communicates love in a way that others can find their seats at that table because it is a desire of the Father that each would find their seat at the table. So he modeled this in that upper room with his disciples in that last moment before his crucifixion, what it really means to create space for others and to create space through a willingness to serve and show others the full extent of the love of the Father and the privilege that it is for all to find their seat at the table. The table is space for nurturing relationships, both with the head as well as with the others at the table. I believe that it is God's desire for us to be able to experience each other in the joy of life and in in a setting where we can experience life together and be nurtured and to be blessed. 
this, this space at the table, I believe, is about relationships. And for some reason, and maybe just me, but I just really value setting together and breaking bread together around tables. There's something about that that communicates a, uh, an openness to uh, allow space for others in your life and to enjoy life together and to experience life together. There's something that happens around tables that is very, very special in that way. And I believe it's what Jesus wanted to communicate here when he portrays this picture of this table that is set for us, that he desires for us to be able to experience life together as we interact with each other and we recognize that we uh, have commonality with each other regardless of our last names or regardless even of denominational affiliations. There is this table that is set for all of us to be able to experience God's kingdom together. The table is full of provision. There is plenty to eat and drink. And he says, pray this way. Pray, uh, give us this day our daily bread. As he desires to meet our physical needs. He desires to meet all of our needs. The needs of, uh, of our whole person. Both physical, emotional, and spiritual needs. And I believe that... Jesus is committed to feeding all those who come, and his provision is not limited. There will always be enough for everyone. And I believe that uh, in light of how Jesus uh, sees people coming to the table, he, he sees them as individuals that uh, can be recipients of his healing. They're recipients of of his daily bread, recipients of his anointing, as he gives himself and gives himself again over and over again for the goodness of all that come to the table. I believe that he is fully committed to our wholeness as individuals. And I, I see that as... as we are physical beings and we are emotional beings and we are spiritual beings and that we have a spirit within us and I believe that God understands how that spirit can be fed in such a way that we can be strong in who we are as individuals. I believe that a measure of our spirit is really a a, a measure of how we are experiencing life because one of the things that determines when life stops is when our spirit leaves the body. That is the, that is the ultimate time of, of our body no longer having life within it, the fullness of life. But Jesus says, I am come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So I believe that he is very interested in feeding our spirit just as much, if not even more, than our physical body as we come to the table. How can our spirit be fed? As, as I understand our spirit and our, our emotions and uh, how we are how, our, how we are fed as emotional beings, uh, there are some things that are very recognizable that bring life to us as individuals. And one of those areas is in the area of, of God's presence. When we experience God's presence, our spirit gets fed. We experience life through his, his presence. And and that happens in multiple ways, and it can happen as we open up God's word. As we open up his inspired word and we read his word, it's the, the spirit that is in the word because it is inspired reading, it is the inspired word of God, we experience his spirit in a way that brings life to us, that we can, our spirit can be fed as we get into the word and allow his word to get into us. Our spirit within us can be fed as we worship and praise and function in thanksgiving, as we even listen to inspired 
worship and praise music, our spirit gets fed and we get lifted up. We get strengthened by that as we subject ourselves to God's way of our spirit being fed. Our spirit gets fed as we interact with the Father, as we interact with Jesus, as we pray, as we talk to him, as we experience him in our life that way, our spirit gets fed. I'm, I'm sure you've had those kinds of occasions of, of coming before God and you realize that your spirit is strengthened as you interact with him in that way. Our spirit can be strengthened. Our spirit can be fed as we fellowship together. As we fellowship together as brothers and sisters and we encourage each other and we, and we strengthen each other in faith just by walking together and being there for each other, our spirit can be fed. As we look at these different areas, and I haven't fully concluded that this is an exhaustive list of ways that our spirit can be fed, but I don't believe that there are many others, if there are any others, in, uh, in the way that our spirit can really be fed in healthy ways. And as you look at these areas that I have just mentioned, this really describes and this really pictures the family of God setting. This really pictures this essence of a congregation providing this place to come together and sit at the table. The place where we can worship and our spirit gets fed. The place where we seek to hear the word of God, the inspired word of God, and our spirit gets fed. The place where we pray together and our spirit gets fed. The place where we experience wonderful fellowship together as brothers and sisters and our spirit gets fed. The table is a special place. This is a special place here called Groftdale. And I believe that the Lord creates these settings here, there, and all over the world in villages and towns and cities, even in houses where the table is set. <laughs> Individuals come and gather. They get encouraged. Their spirits get fed. And, individual, and we experience that abundant life that God has for his children as we create our space. I'm very thankful for the blessing of Zoom and online kinds of connections that we have in our day. And for some that aren't able to, to gather because of, uh, of being homebound or whatever it may be, it provides this opportunity to be able to connect in some way. But I'm not sure that it will ever fully be able to replace this actual coming together as living beings and experiencing each other around the table. So that privilege is here. That privilege, the table is set. And it's so wonderful as I look over this group here today to see the privileged, to see those that have accepted their, their place at that table and are being blessed by their seat and accepting their place as a father, I find the greatest sat satisfaction, I believe, as a dad when there's a nice family table set and the children come and take their seat. And you can sense that they're glad to be there. They're thrilled to be there at the family table. And when it's time to eat, they all eat. A pain, a hurt of a father would be that in providing for this wonderful table of so much of plenty would be that if the children came to the table drudgingly, reluctantly, and didn't even eat when it was set before them. God has set a wonderful table in front of us. He desires for us to find our place, to find our seat. But not only to just sit in the seat, 
but to receive from him what he desires for his children to receive, the blessing of life. He is a good, good father, and he desires to bless his children in wonderful ways. I like this scripture promise in Luke 11, 11 to 13, where he says, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? I believe it's the work of the Holy Spirit to really draw us together and to help us to find our place and to help us to be a uh, uh, alert to our to our place in fact if you look at uh, the scriptures in galatians it refers to one of the uh, the greatest lists of characteristics of a healthy culture uh, at the table would be to be able to experience the fruit of the of the spirit at the table love joy peace all characteristics of a wonderful setting and I believe it's the setting that is meant for us to be able to experience as God's children and it these fruit are referred to as the gifts of the spirit and the, the definition that I can appreciate most for this fruit of the spirit is that the these characteristics are the product of just like a, an apple is the product of what? An apple tree. So the gifts of the Spirit are the product of what? The Holy Spirit. As we think of ourselves and as we experience other products in our world, if we have a medical condition and need some medications or something, we, we would go to a pharmacy because that's where we would find the product of pharma pharmaceutical companies that have produced these medications, that medications are a fruit of a pharmaceutical company. So we go to pharmacies if we need something of medical attention. So if we are needing a greater measure of love in our lives, if we're needing a greater measure of joy in our lives, if we're needing a greater measure of peace in our lives, and on and on, the invitation is there to go to the, the, the source. And the, the word says that the source of these areas is the Holy Spirit, that we, these are the fruit of the Holy Spirit, that just as we would go to a pharmaceutical company to get medications if we need medication, if we need these other areas in our life, we can open ourselves up and go to the provision that the Lord has for us for the anointing of his Holy Spirit to be able to experience this in ways that it would be in alignment with what the measure that God would have for us to be able to experience and appreciate. I consider my wife an easy individual to love, but there are those days, and in those days I have found that I may need to ask for some help. So I ask the Holy Spirit, I ask the Lord for the Holy Spirit to help me in the midst of this day, in the midst of this time. And guess what happens? <laughs> Just as a father loves to give good gifts to his children if they ask him, so the Father, our loving Father, loves to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. We need him. We need him. We need the work of his Holy Spirit to help us in the midst of this table setting that it will be the picture, the measure of anointing that he would want for it to be. In Psalms 23, he describes this picture this way, and he says, I have set before you a table in the presence of your enemies. There are enemies that are envious of that table that is set for the children of God. 
Those enemies would love to steal everything that they could from the people that are seated at that table and their ways that that individual seated at the table allow room for that thief to be able to steal it from time to time. And I, I, I can't go down over a long list of areas that the enemy uses in order to steal this wonderful setting and atmosphere where love can flow freely and grace can happen and in, it, spirits are inspired. One of those areas <clears throat> and I, I, is this driving a wedge in between relationships. And another way of describing that is simply offenses that happen. And over this whole last several years of the challenges of COVID and all that was happening, there were relationships being challenged and the old enemy was watching these settings where the table was set and he was operating to drive wedges in there and he sowed seeds that created offenses and individuals allowed for offenses to happen in ways that it created separation at the table. I believe it broke the heart of the Father. I've come to this place in light of under, uh, believing, the, believing for God's best for his people that I have concluded according to God's word and his kingdom heart for his people that there is absolutely no space or justification for offense to happen in the kingdom of God at the table. Absolutely none. You can't find it in scripture. It's not the heart of the Father to allow room for fences to exist, especially not when he went to the full extent to show us what forgiveness is all about and the need to forgive each other and that the culture of the kingdom and the culture at the table is a spirit of forgiveness to be able to make room for the person right next to you as we forgive each other and create space for the flow of God's love to all of those at the table. As Levi read this passage from Luke chapter 14. Jesus says, come for everything is ready. <laughs> the table is set. It's a wonderful table. It's a table for all of us. It's a table for the many of the world. In Revelations, it said, the spirit and the bride say, come, come and eat and drink. Jesus said at Jacob's well, when he met there with the Samaritan woman and, and the disciples came back from, pur from purchasing food as he went into the city. And, and uh, I don't know what kind of questions they asked Jesus. So what all is happening here? But Jesus says, I have food that you know not of. And then as he shares with this Samaritan woman who had a very empty life, I believe, he said he offered this living water. He said, drink of this water and you will never thirst again. <laughs> I don't know how else to explain this blessing of the table other than what is set there is beyond our imagination. It's meant for our life, it's meant for our wholeness, it's meant for our strength, it's meant for us to be able to thrive, it's meant for us to be able to be inspired and that, so that our spirits can be strong because when our spirits become weak, we, go, we, we find ourselves waning down a, 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 a cycle of going from discouragement to despair to de to depression as our spirits grow weaker and weaker and weaker and at the bottom of that is death itself when our spirit actually yields. God's desire is for us to be able to experience life from the table. And I believe his heart as the head of the church and as he commissioned the early church to go from village to village and establish congregations and see the church multiply, I believe his plan is yet the same. For the church to thrive and for the table to be set in the midst of congregations here, there, and around the world. I'm excited for that. Very blessed by your pastor Tom sharing again last week at Camp Hebron of this picture, this global picture of the table being sent, set from all nations. 
those of you that were there, found in that the encouragement of the group to hear the stories of how God is setting the table in many different circles around the world, around the globe, as missionaries went out from LMC and EMM over the years in different settings, and, and your pastor is helping to nurture this setting of us being together at the table. It's powerful. Thank you for allowing your pastor to serve in that way. Trust that it will always be a blessing to you here. I don't know how to better explain and define this table. I don't have the words. My picture of it is certainly not exhaustive. But one of the things that I recognize that in God's kingdom and for his kingdom people, that we can know that he is for us and not against us. And that he has more for us than we can imagine. And one of the things that describe who he is is this reality that there is more. There is always more for us. And he says, I will bless those who are hungry and thirsty. And those that come will be blessed. I believe that in light of the circumstances of our world today, and I'm not going into politics, I'm not going into uh, worldview here, but in light of the needs of our world today, I say this, our world needs an awakening of the things of God. Our world needs an awakening. What would awakening look like? My heart is for an awakening for Lancaster County. My heart is for an awakening of LMC. My heart is for an awakening of our people of our state, our country, and the world. We need an awakening. What would an awakening look like? I believe an awakening would look like a people that are being alert to the opportunities of the day. An awakening would be having eyes to be able to see and ears that are able to hear. So awakening across the church, I believe, would be for a people to see the awakening that God has for the people that are blind to this privilege that they would have to come to the table. I believe an awakening would be that people that have ignored and have believed the, believed the lies that they can live and be okay without coming to the table, would be awakened to be able to see it differently and to be able to recognize the wonderful privilege and the deep longing within them would really to be at that table and to receive that, but they've been believing a lie that they could get along without it. That would be an awakening. I believe an awakening would be the reality that the church realizes that Jesus' invitation is going out to the many. That Jesus, that's his heart for them to come. But he has said to the church, as he did to this servant here in John, Luke chapter 14, where he says, go. I believe that an awakening for the church would be to realize that we have a stack of invitations in our hands to come to the table. That the table is ready. The table is set. And we have these invitations in our hands to be able to spread, spread the news. That, the, that many would be able to recognize that this table is set. And there's a seat there with their name on it. I believe that would be the awakening of the Holy Spirit. We in Lancaster Conference, with our new mission, have, called our, have this sense of call to be a spirit-led movement. And Keith Weaver, moderator, for the last of his moderator addresses on Sunday morning last week, after giving 22 state of the conference, or 21 state of the conference moderator addresses on an annual basis. He shared his last one as he will be retiring October 1st. And he, he said this as, as he began his address, made it clear that this will not be a state of the conference address this year. This will be a state of the movement address. I believe God's calling us 
And we as bishops and across LMC, the leaders of LMC, have all affirmed that this is an hour to be a spirit-led movement, to allow room for the work of the Holy Spirit to lead and direct and build the church, and to create an awakening for the table that is set, that the many can come and find their way from the north, the south, the east, and the west to find their seat at the table. We're a privileged people. I believe for a revival, and revival will happen. New life will come as we function as awakened people and respond to what we're able to see and hear as the Spirit leads us and moves. So I know Jesus is here today. Le Levi and I had a, a witness of the Spirit here earlier. I said, Levi. The Lord's here. The Lord loves being here with his people. So I'm going to pray here and just invite you to be thankful for whatever way you've accepted this place. And I invite you to open yourself up <laughs> to, to be able to say, yes, I'm in. I receive my seat. <laughs> That's what Jesus, as a father, your loving father, wants you to be content in your seat, to be at peace in your seat, to receive in your seat, to eat and drink as he sets it in front of us as his kingdom people. May the church be blessed. May many be blessed as we accept ourselves for who we are as the people of God. Let's pray. Father God, we consider this a wonderful privilege to be known by you and to be able to find our names on that list, acknowledging that we have a seat at the table. And if there's anyone here today that isn't so certain about that, or if there's someone listening online that is uncertain about this um, certainty of being able to know that you have your seat there. I just encourage you to open up your heart today to that invitation as Jesus is saying, come to you to take your seat. He has paid the price through his shed blood for the forgiveness of your sins to be able to cleanse us and in that cleansing, in that righteousness, we are able to come with wedding garments, fully dressed to take our place. It's a privilege, a place of blessing. And that's for each one of us. That's for each that have a name. That's for each that have breath. To be able to experience that cleansing and blessing of that seat. So I just say, come Lord Jesus. Come among your people here. Lord, as individuals eat and drink, Lord, may it be beyond imagination as we experience you. For you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we are able to ask or imagine according to your spirit that is at work within us. So fill us with your love. Fill us with your joy. Fill us with your peace, your patience, your kindness, your goodness, your self-control. Fill us, oh God, as your people. Fill us with a spirit of forgiveness that offers to the world hope because there's nothing that we could have done that would be too much to separate us from your love or from this seat at the table that is for us. All we need to do is come to you and ex accept your free gift of forgiveness and take our place. So Lord, we, we pray your blessing over us. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. So what it means to be servants and serving at the table and creating space for those empty those that have seats left empty at the table yet at this time so come lord jesus come come in the midst of us in costa rica come in the midst of us in europe come in the midst of us in morocco Come, Lord Jesus, 
and bless us as we take that seat and function as your blessed children. For you are a good, good Father. In your name, amen. Praise the Lord. In the Father's house, there's a place for me. At his table, there's a place for me. Thank you, Brother Lloyd. And to those in live stream, um, we, we plan to see you at the table sometime in person. So peace to you as you, um, as you continue this week. <laughs> 